Amsterdam. Um, and it's, it's delightful to present this. Um, I, I, I should mention this really is joint work with Kathy Strandberg, who uh, I don't believe is able to make it. Um, she herself has an interesting background. She has a doctorate in physics and then became a patent lawyer and then a law professor. So um, it's truly uh, an interdisciplinary project. Um, and uh, it's, I'm afraid it's, it's more of a manifesto um, than a, a, a sort of original research presentation. There's one empirical result. And that is um, looking at a, a database of law journal articles um, for law and economics, you get 35,000 articles. And that distribution drops off very steeply when you start looking at other social sciences. So law and sociology gives you 3,000 articles. Law and psychology gives you 1,500 articles. Uh, but for agent-based modeling, you get merely 80 articles. And so really this is a, a call to action for agent-based modeling uh, in, in and as a part of legal scholarship. Uh, and what we think is at stake here is legal design, which we're defining as that kind of legal scholarship, which is aimed at designing and evaluating regulations, specifically, in order to achieve societal goals. So this is explicitly a consequentialist project. We're not talking about abstract deontological duties, we're talking about outcomes. And because we're talking about the outcomes of regulations, uh, the success of that project is going to depend on social scientific predictions. You can't do this kind of work without a social science. And our, uh, you know, we ourselves are, to, are involved in agent-based modeling as a social scientific method, uh, and we're, we're becoming increasingly invested in it. Um, if you're not familiar, agent-based modeling originates probably in mathematical sociology, but it's now very widely used. It's an interdisciplinary method. It's used in economics, it's used in public health, it's used in environmental science and urban demography and more. Some, some classic examples are the Schelling model of segregation in an urban environment. Uh, there's also many agent-based models used in epidemiology, uh, variations on compartmental epidemiological models. Uh, there's an increasing amount of agent-based modeling used in say financial research. Um, there's uh, agent-based models of, of auctions for energy markets and all sorts of, sorts of other projects. Uh, ABMs are computed simulations that have multiple agents, and they can exhibit nonlinearity and feedback effects that we associate with complex systems. And one argument for them uh, that's been posed by a colleague um, and mentor, Joshua Epstein, is that this is especially good for a bottom-up generative social science. There's emergent social phenomena that we're trying to explain, and we know that society is made of people. How is it that the interactions between many agents give rise to this emergent phenomena? Well, you can explain that, he argues, with, with a simulation. And our thesis is that the time is right now for agent-based models use in legal design. Um, we see that there's a, the current king of the hill, as we saw in the first slide, is law and economics. Uh, economics being the social scientific discipline that is most widely used currently in legal design and legal theory. And it's a somewhat narrow version of economics that's made its way into legal theory, we argue, and it's a significant and important approach. And it makes uh, important claims like we should take this ex ante approach. Um, we should look at a regulation and say what how does that regulation shape incentives? Those incentives are going to uh, create or lead to people's actions ex post. And uh, we can therefore use those regulations to aim at maximizing social welfare. Um, now, social welfare gets operationalized via very neoclassical economic assumptions. Uh, 
So often the assumption is that there are rational utility maximizing agents. Uh, they're optimizing individual utility and uh, normally utility is interpreted as, as somewhat grossly just wealth in this literature so that it's easy to add up those utility levels. Um, the, the goal of much of this scholarship is to create a wealth maximizing society, assuming that you can then redistribute that wealth um, in a sort of frictionless way, which um, is not necessarily realistic. And, but there's also this uh, emphasis on strategic equilibrium. And sometimes that, uh, that can distort the results um, we find. So um, this is a very popular approach in legal scholarship. And it's, it's, it's not just in the scholarship, it's also in the reasoning of judges. Uh, it's in the work of public agency rulemaking, such as cost benefit analysis. And I should say, um, I'm an American, my co-author is an American. I, I know I'm not speaking to Americans and my perspective is very, very biased towards the US. So um, I'd love it if in the, in the discussion, there was some sort of comparative analysis. Uh, I don't actually know um, how true any of this is of European legal scholarship and legal reasoning. Um, but uh, at least for the US, why is this so successful? Um, a cynical explanation would be that the law and economics view uh, has been successfully rallied in support of an anti-regulatory ideology, which for sort of political economic reasons is, is popular in the US. But uh, we're not primarily aimed at that aspect of law and economics. We, we are interested in its intellectual merits, and it does have very good merits in that it's very flexible and general, and it's useful. You don't have to be a quantitative scholar to get useful insights from the law and economics literature. You can be a hand waver and still uh, get good practical guidelines for how to educate a decision in a, say, in a court case, or how to uh, design some kind of policy. Uh, on the other hand, law and economics has been so dominant for so long that there's now a lot of pushback um, from legal theory movements. So uh, there's a relatively new movement called calling itself law and political economy or law and political economics, which is uh, referring to political economy as the discipline of Adam Smith and David Ricardo, uh, a sort of prior view, broader view of economics than, um, than neoclassical assumptions would make. And they're trying to do this in order to, to bring the legal scholarship to, to take seriously things like wealth disparity, systemic racism, uh, power dynamics and disparities within groups, which manifest as economic phenomena. Um, they're not a, a, you know, somehow a strictly cultural phenomenon. They are economic realities, but they're, it's political economy. Um, somewhat separately, there's uh, a lot of push for a new way of doing macroeconomics for, for law to be more responsive to a post-2008 financial crisis macroeconomic trends. Um, you know, Alan Greenspan, uh, quite famously after 2008, said, I've been wrong about economics this whole time. Uh, the field of economics has been going through many uh, shifts to try to understand what, what was missing from their sort of micro foundations. Um, and uh, consider uh, Bookstaber's book, The End of Theory, which is an argument that uh, in order to predict financial crises, we need new kinds of methods such as agent-based modeling. So um, there's many different economic critiques of law and economics uh, that are suggesting that we need new methods that don't depend as much on the methodological individualism that current law and economics depends on. So we've got several internal critiques of law and economics that uh, are really quite pressing today. So. Uh, this rational actor assumption, you know, um, it's old news that human beings do not 
uh, fulfill these rational actor assumptions. Behavioral economics has been around for some time. Um, there are There is plenty of legal scholarship that incorporates behavioral economics, but this bounded rationality issue is still very challenging. Um, uh, the idea that uh, individualist utility function and sort of the sum of individual utilities is, is what's important as a societal goal has been very seriously critiqued. Um, if we know that something like inequality has an impact on society, we can't ignore the systemic and emergent societal effects. Uh, something is wrong with methodological individualism, uh, even as an empirical matter. Uh, further, uh, many of these older economics methods had a very naive way of aggregating the behavior of agents. They would say, here's an entire sector of an economy. Um, let's treat it like just one agent that acts for all of them. And that neglected heterogeneity. It neglected the interaction between those agents. It was essentially a mean field method, which requires that the, the agents are acting independently of each other. In most cases, they are not. There's lots of recent work in macroeconomics that uh, is about heterogeneous agent modeling. That heterogeneous agent modeling uh, methodology is, is uh, in many ways contiguous with agent-based modeling. Uh, and lastly, um, whereas scholarship that focuses on the one strategic equilibrium uh, means that the models need to be tailored to create that kind of result, it's almost a publication bias. Whereas um, if there are multiple equilibria and path dependence to getting them there, then that could be impactful for realistic policy. So for all of these points, agent-based modeling can come to the rescue. Uh, agent-based modeling often has very low, even zero intelligence agents. It's designed to uh, display and explain emergent phenomena. Uh, it can aggregate uh, through a, a broad range of mechanisms. Um, and can display multiple equilibria and path dependence. Uh, and meanwhile, there's an increasing number of interdisciplinary law and technology scholars. I'm one of them uh, that's, that are coming into legal scholarship from, from questions based around big data and AI and machine learning um, and are interested in applying technology to the law. Um, these are also fields where agent-based modeling can make an impact in the law. And there's also uh, you know, a steady trickle of people interested in complexity and network and systems that get involved in legal scholarship. And the computation is getting easier and the software is getting easier to use. Um, so in terms of technical capacity, which is certainly a limiting factor for this kind of work, uh, you know, the bounds are getting lifted. So we think that there's a lot of opportunity here. Um, we see two ways forward. Uh, the simplest, which maybe is the closest to the way agent-based modeling is currently done, is just to do simulations of specific cases and problems and publish them. Um, so there's lots of agent-based modeling work uh, as a result of COVID-19, for example. And as I mentioned, there's modeling work for financial markets and climate change and tax compliance and housing segregation. Um, and this is sort of how this scientific work is normally done. And that's fine, but we think that in order to make an impact on legal theory, a somewhat different orientation may be necessary because agent-based modeling, um, in order to be as successful in law, as law and economics, needs to have general, generalizable, actionable insights. So whereas law and economics has been very influential in, in uh, promulgating that incentives really matter and that uh, in order to solve a problem with policy, you need to internalize its externality. We haven't yet gotten that from an ABM or a complexity perspective. So we're wondering what are the high level general insights that this complexity or agent-based modeling perspective can bring to law and more broadly politics, uh, because, because those are what's going to be employed in a judicial or a legislative setting. Whereas a very specific model that may be very 
uh, tied to the empirics of a situation that can be hard to come by and they can be very easily contested and they can be quite brittle. So how do we get something that like a robust insight based on a range of models rather than a highly specific but fragile model? And so this is our challenge. Um, how can agent-based modeling reveal compelling general principles for new legal theory? And uh, we don't have ready answers for this yet. Um, just as a, an example, one of the best papers we know of along these lines is published in the same issue of Frontiers of Physics um, as ours. Uh, this Malka Ian Sharafri paper uh, is very interesting and in, in that's about um, the appropriate legal responses to something like COVID-19. Um, traditional legal theories like proportionality and equality and least restrictive means are kind of designed for a linear world a world where um, you want your response to be pro linearly proportional to the effect that's happening. But in a nonlinear world, um, that's just going to lead to an epidemic. You really want a disproportionate response early on, and you want to uh, unequally apply your interventions because you're concerned about super spreaders. The, the network topology is not even. Um, where our own work is going with this is um, we're, we're now um, looking at how agent-based modeling might be used to make software systems more accountable. So uh, there's a lot of interest in whether uh, software that's deployed by businesses um, is having uh, social impacts. Um, and we think that the regulators are really interested in the social impact of the software rather than sort of the, the details of the software itself. So we're developing a framework wherein the software can be tested for its social impact in silico with an agent-based model that's a simulation of society that's informed by domain experts. And in this work, we're trying to envision a new regulatory workflow while also looking for these general insights from agent-based modeling that's going to guide the regulation of technology. And this. I'm happy to say has been uh, awarded by the National Science Foundation, and so we'll be working on it for the next three years. Uh, but that's uh, that's where we're at with this work, um, and that's the end of my presentation. Thank you for listening, and uh, really, I'm here to engage in a conversation with all of you. Thank you. The first one is uh, Giuseppe, uh, professor of law and economics at Amsterdam. Uh, Sebastian, you have come to present in a, partly in a law and economic department. So you, you knew where you were heading to, Giuseppe. Uh, thank you. Thanks, uh, uh, Eduardo, for the warning. Uh, so, um, uh, and, and thanks to Sebastian for this great uh, presentation. I, I've toyed with the idea of using agent-based modeling for, for a number of years, and I'm really happy to see that somebody is taking it up seriously. So I, I really think this is a great project with a lot of promise. Uh, I have a couple of comments on how to, um, you know, given that you, 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 you said in the beginning, this is more of, of a manifesto. Um, so my comments are more like on the selling strategy of this new uh, technology that, that you are proposing. And, and I have a couple of comments and uh, to, to, you know, to make constructive um, uh, comments, I want to start from a couple of um, what I think of weaknesses in, in the analysis and, and want to um, uh, say how I, I see things. So first of all, I think you should have published this in frontiers of law, not in frontiers of physics, right? You're trying to sell a method to the lawyers. Um, and by, by publishing Frontier Physics, I felt like you were preaching to the choir in a sense. So, I, I, you know, I'd like to see chapter two published in a, in a, in a law journal. Um, and, and to do so, I would do um, two things. Um, so I really, I was really happy to see that law and economics had 10 times as many hits are, as law and sociology and law and psychology and law and whatever else. But I think you were, 
um, mixing up two layers of analysis about you know, the, how, how we think about land economics. So one is land economics as a method. Um, and the other one is land economics are, as a set of narrow, uh, normative assumptions. All right, so I tend to disagree with your characterizations of law and economics um, as a set of normative assumptions. I think you were referring to you know, law and economics in the 70s, not to law and economics in the uh, 2020s. Um, but the, the main point here is that this part of the paper is largely irrelevant for your analysis. Um, I think you should be, you know, should be focusing on comparing the two methods because the, 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 the contribution here is methodological. So whatever normative um, uh, assumptions you attach to the field you call land economics is, is relatively relevant for your analysis of what, what the uh, way forward should be. Um, um, uh, so, so, for example, you know, you say things like, uh, that that agent-based modeling is based on um, looks at things like system-based uh, properties that are derived from simple models. I mean, I would say you know, land economics does the same. Think of the notion of market equilibrium, starting from simple assumptions about how individual actors behave. So I don't think that should be the main difference between the two fields. And and the the same thing is about the the. Um, assumptions you stress, you know, that early law and economic studies have made, rationality, uh, you know, wealth maximization. I mean, these are all things that have belonged to the past and, you know, modern law and economic scholarship doesn't, doesn't deal with that. So if, you know, if you're basing your analysis and your selling strategy of ancient based theory on a critique of law and economics that deals with law and economics like 30 years ago, uh, I think you're undermining your point. So the way I would do this is to focus on what is the uh, the main uh, you know contribution of agent-based modeling, and that's about complexity. And the reason why we should do agent-based modeling now and it hasn't been done before is not normative. It's not ideological. It's just because now we have computing power and we can run these models efficiently, right? Um, so this is the thing, and and and. Um, I, I think a, a, a simulation model. So it's it's about it's more about simulations versus modeling, uh, rather than you know a set of as normative assumptions versus another set of normative assumptions. Um, Nonlinearity, you know, tipping points, systemic effects, uh, discrete jumps in incentives, feedback. I mean, these are all things that law and economic scholars have tried to deal with. But of course, you know, if you have a if you have a simulation model, you can deal with these things differently than if you have a theory-based uh, model that you want to solve analytically, right? So I think, you know, I was missing the part in which you really explain where in a simulation is more likely to give you interesting results than a, a, a model based on analytic solutions. Uh, right. So, so the, 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 you know, the, the areas in which you, you show agent-based modeling has been uh, used successfully, like, like um, bank uh, stress tests, this suggests also, you know, that this is the kind of things, you know, where you want to focus. So I would really want to hear from you, you know, what are the areas of the law that you think uh, agent-based modeling can most likely illuminate? You know, where is the advantage of having simulations where you have more inputs in the model uh, better than having a, a simpler model where you can drive one of these solutions? So the way we have been used to doing theories in land economics is to have a set of simple assumptions you can understand, that a set of results on which you can build robust intuitions. Now, when the complex is, when the system is very complex, this, this, you know, this hits its limitations, this method. So you want to go with simulations, you want to throw more data into the models, you want to calibrate, you want to put more variables, nonlinear effects, whatever. But you also lose things, right? You lose interpretability, you don't know, uh, you know, uh, very much what's going on in the model. You might uh, be at a loss finding, uh, you know, robust intuitions. So, it, it, you know, it, it, the, the revolution you are, you are advocating is similar to what has been going on in empirical research. When you move from econometric models to, you know, big data, AI, machine learning, 
right? So you can do more things, you can throw more data in the model, but then you're losing a bit of insights of what the model is actually doing. So, you know, uh, I, the, the bottom line, line is I'm really happy you wanna sell the methods, uh, but I would have wanna learn much more about what are the methodological advantages of this rather than the ideological underpinnings of some, you know, uh, theory you stake your 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 own uh, proposal against. I would give Sebastian the opportunity to uh, react, and then we go on with the uh, uh, Q and A. Uh, your points are really well taken, and um, I uh, I guess I'd like to hear more uh, more questions and discussion. Okay, that was quick. Uh, next in line is uh, Laura Burgess, and then we have uh, Maria Bartoli here in the, in the room. Yes, thank you very much. So I am not somebody from law and economics, but from the private law department. So in a way, um, well, I'm much less knowledgeable than Giuseppe on all, all of these topics. So I was genuinely interested in how this agent-based modeling actually works. So what I work on myself is cases about climate change uh, and their economic arguments often come up. So uh, big oil corporations who are sued for their responsibility for climate change say, um, well, for instance, in the Netherlands, we had Royal Dutch Shell and they said, well, if we don't pump up the oil, then Gazprom will do it uh, uh, or another, other company that is way dirtier than us. So often economic kind of arguments are made. Um, so I was wondering, could you indeed, to, to, to assess the, the validity of such arguments, could you use this method? And how would that then work? Because is this not, well, these kinds of questions are often very uncertain and, and how, how, yeah, how would agent-based modeling work in such a case? And then, so I, I'm really interested in the method as such, like how does it work technically? What kind of data do you use for this? And, and on a technical matter, but I'm also interested in the possible outcomes. So I was very much intrigued by this paper that you mentioned um, around the pandemic and about the, the need perhaps for a disproportionate standard rather than one of proportionality. And I was wondering very much, does that indeed imply that we need other legal norms or would it rather mean a new interpretation of a standard like proportionality? So what could be the outcome of this, uh, legally speaking as well? I'm very much interested and looking forward to uh, hear from you. And by the way, I really enjoyed the presentation. I forgot to say that, so thanks a lot. Thank you so much for that. Um, I, I guess I can speak a little bit to, um, the how the method works, um, and, and maybe that will also answer to uh, address some of Giuseppe's comments. Um, it's a very broad uh, method. Uh, uh, um, you know, uh, wearing the hat of presenting the paper. Uh, you know, it's um, you know, it it's it's the greatest thing since sliced bread. Uh, I'm aware of lots of critiques of the method. Also, you know, uh, the point that it is um, it, introducing a lot of complexity, you know, I think the uh, analogy between sort of big data and econometrics is very apt. Um, however, um, you can use empirical data. This comes up all the time. Um, so, uh, you know, you would basically write a program that involves many agents interacting. Uh, often it's using discrete time. Um, there, um, things sort of evolve over time according to uh, ideally as simple rules as possible, um, you know, and, uh, and you can calibrate these models to particular cases based on empirical data. So uh, one way to think about this, you can, you can easily put empirical data into the inputs by say, using the actual popul population densities of people in uh, various cities and countries, and, and using that to inform sort of the starting conditions of the model. Um, it's much more difficult, of course, to create accurate predictions. Um, so uh, it is possible to, to sort of train uh, these models, um, sort of fit them. Uh, I, I think the logic of that works like any other sort of model fitting exercise in computer science. Um, and you get the same kinds of problems with the say like a variance variance trade-off um, where the more complex the model is the more brittle 
your fit is, which is uh, which is another motive for why methodologically we're interested in in what kind of general results can come out of a complexity oriented approach. Um, I, I I don't think it's possible to answer all of your questions, but hopefully that that um, was sufficient for some of them. Thanks. Thank you, Maria. You want to come here with the mic? Yeah. Come because otherwise our uh, speaker doesn't hear. I think the others will uh, do well. Um, so thanks a lot. Uh, I'm also a private lawyer, so my comments will be um, both in some ways a little bit linked to Laura's. Um, so I'm very much I'm very much impressed with it. You know, so I am somebody who works more or less in law and political economy. So now I understand why I was. A you know, attracted by this by this paper even before I really kind of got to the passage where you would <laughs> discuss the potential relevance. Um, and so, so my question is: so you say basically the the, the, the comp this complexity modeling allows you also to observe how structures emerge, uh, how interactions lead to kind of creation of structures. But so the question really goes to you know what goes into the model. So of course we are talking here about systems which are historically kind of given. Uh, so you somehow need to also uh, input in the, into the system, you know, existing power structures, power differentials. How do you do that? Can you do that? And if you can't do that, that becomes rather, you know, more difficult to use for the kind of uh, law and political economy uh, uh, project. Um, and so Another question that I had uh, relates a little bit to the role of cooperation. And so I, you know, so, so as somebody who comes, you know, from very different corner, uh, I don't really see myself, you know, being able to do the, this by myself. Uh, um, I think my, my boyfriend actually did try to teach me how to uh, how to uh, program, but it was a basically a failure because it like it really like you know my, my attention went too too quickly it took too, too quickly away from his uh, uh, explanation. So um, so what is then the role of cooperation there? Uh, uh, and you know so, so basically I think if we want to do something like this, we need to have somebody who really masters the method and then basically in conversation uh, do something along those lines uh, uh, if we want to do this well. Um, and the third question is, so also I really liked what you say in the paper uh, that uh, so one potential very useful uh, thing to do with the method is to look at how precautionary principle actually, what are the, the context and you know, kind of implications uh, 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 of, its, uh, of its use uh, in, in, in legal and, and of course so regulatory reasoning. Another thing that I actually was thinking is uh, maybe if, if you could now try to reason by yourself, what would you do if you wanted to think how an introducing a new corporate form, so now, for example, benefit, public benefit corporation in the US, you know, how that, you know, what, what is that, you know, what, the, what is that somebody who would like to think about this uh, uh, would need to, you know, at least start thinking about uh, um, uh, if I wanted, you know, to get somebody on board to, to, to do this kind of model uh, uh, for it or simulation. Thanks. Oh, fantastic. Um, as far as I know, um, getting a, uh, uh, a convincing model of the existing power structures um, at a kind of, you know, nation or continent wide political level um, has not been like completed, uh, or there's no consensus around, around what that model would be. Um, and uh, it's a, it's a, it's, I think it's a, it's a big, somewhat open problem. Um, you're right. Uh, you know, the, if we're saying that agent-based modeling can be used to address these law and political economy questions, that's sort of, we're asking to, for, for an answer to that. And we're, we're claiming that agent-based modeling can do that. Um, uh, maybe that's out there in the literature and maybe I just don't know about it. But yeah, I think you're absolutely right that that's a, we, we should open that question um, and that I don't have an answer for it yet. Um, in terms of uh, cooperation, sort of interdisciplinary cooperation, um, uh, it, it's quite, a, I've, I've got a research assistant now uh, who uh, is coming not from a technical background at all. Um, uh, I think they had like a little bit, maybe a tiniest bit of programming experience, but really not, not much. Um, and they came to, uh, came to this research project, very open eyed, uh, uh, with, you know, an interest in a particular topic. And basically, um, 
yeah, I said, listen, if we want to do this, you just need to install net logo and we're just going to start doing it. I think that, um, and, and now we're several months into the project and they have, um, you know, they've got a model that has the uh, agents moving around and they're interacting and they're reaching equilibria. Um, it's taken a while to, to sort of train them on it. Um, but I, I think one, one thing that's appealing about it is that um, you can, to some extent, take your uh, qualitative intuitions and translate them into programmatic rules. Uh, maybe you need to work with, uh, you know, a programmer in order to do this. But um, it, it's, it's more open-ended, and I think the barrier to entry may be lower than sort of analytic mathematical modeling in the economics tradition. Um, you know, it's, uh, so I, I, would, um, I would be bold and uh, try to find a, um, you know, a programmer or collaborator and, and see if you can start building the model and, um, and see what happens. I think the agent-based modeling community uh, gatekeeps less than the economics community um, in my experience. And so it may be easier to, um, to publish a res uh, result with a model that may um, you know, seem less uh, analytically refined. Um, in terms of the question of uh, new uh, forms, corporate forms, I think that's an amazing problem. Um, and I'd love to see more uses of agent-based model to, for these sort of organization design questions. Uh, I haven't thought about how to do that yet, but I, um, I think that's an amazing problem. Thanks. I think we can uh, kind of couple uh, the questions by Giovanni, Sileno, and Veronica. Uh, so please, Giovanni, and then Veronica, and then Sebastian can um, reply. Uh, in, so, well, I haven't understood. We need to have both questions at the same time. So me and then Veronica and then, okay. So um, my question would be, so I, I come more on the computational side of this story, let's say. So my question would be rather, how do you compare that with the existing literature that is on computational social science? Because it is true that there is not so much of resonance on the legal side of the story. But on the other end, there are a lot of studies and attempt to do this kind of, uh, let's say, more from the computational social science, in which there is all this problem of organizational theory has been already studied since at least the 90s in a, in a much more frequent way. So with respect to that, you may find part of these patterns already there. You don't necessarily refer, refer to them here in this presentation. So what is actually interesting to me, and I wanted to ask you a little bit, what do you think about it? It's why what has been happening into that community has not been passing into the legal community. So, in, in, so there is something interesting there. Let's say a kind of community miscommunication or not communication in a way. And then with respect to the methodological point that was also raising Giuseppe, in the sense it is true that at the end, everybody of us in the legal, in the sociological, in the computational side, we are using some model of agents. So at the base, we are all using already agent-based modeling. So what this agent-based mod, agent modeling community should do is to work more on the interface, on how to put they, those agent-based models into computational models. So there may be something which is still lacking at the level of tools and that's connecting with the question of Maria and the others, how to do these things. So I wanted to know a little bit, what do you think about that? Veronica. Great, thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to say hi, really, I, I don't have a question. So um, I wanted to say, um, I'm, I'm hi from Copenhagen. Um, I am running a five-year project where one of the elements of that project, we're looking at how states behave when they um, are asked to respect human rights by international courts. And we're essentially using agent-based modeling uh, to try and understand how states learn from each other and how maybe internal agents affect that compliance and implementation. But one of the problems, um, or, or I'd say challenges we are having is finding people in the legal field um, who are using these kind of models. Uh, and so we're actually trying to put together a network of people who would be interested in 
collaborating on like a new workshop together or actually putting together a panel for the yearly um, simulation conference. Um, so uh, we, I just wanted to say hi and so that you've got us on the map that we're there also working on this. There is another lawyer that we've sort of seen from our side and I think it's Alex Schwartz at Hong Kong. So he's done a few papers on using agent-based modeling in constitutional law. Uh, but I think um, we've been having sort of uh, big issues finding people who've bridged the gap. So yeah, hi. Awesome. Uh, in reverse order, um, hi, that sounds great. Uh, I'd love to talk to you more about some kind of workshop. We've been thinking about organizing a workshop on our end. Uh, it sounds like we've got a lot to talk about. Um, I, I'll try to follow up by email and if I, if I don't, uh, please feel free to um, so we can connect. Uh, and you should definitely meet Kathy Strandberg, who is uh, largely the, uh, the originator of this project. Um, the, uh, uh, to Giovanni, um, I, I think the, the, the two great questions, I guess um, what we think is that the results from uh, computational social science have been slow to make it into sort of legal scholarship, partly because of this, um, you know, the blessing and curse of complexity. So uh, what are the kind of narrative, um, narrative general principles that can come out of the agent-based modeling that can uh, be used by people like judges and legislators. So I think that there's, to some extent, it's like the quality of the scientific theory that's coming out of that computational social science community. Uh, it may also be uh, have to do with this sort of uh, technical skills gap, of course, um, but maybe a more concerted effort to uh, to drive this as an agenda, maybe it just hasn't been that sort of affected as a, as a sort of political, you know, little p academic pol political uh, effort. Uh, in terms of um, building computational tools for the kinds of agent-based, broadly speaking, modeling that are already used in economics, et cetera, uh, I'm involved in a project called EconArc, and it's actually a computational economics toolkit that uh, is led by uh, macroeconomist Chris Carroll. And uh, we wouldn't describe that project as an agent-based modeling project. We just call that a heterogeneous agent modeling project in that it, um, it's much more sort of equation-driven, uh, dynamic equilibria. Uh, the, the agents act according to sort of intertemporal choice optimization problems. It's more like control theory. But, um, but there's another project uh, that we're using where we're using that as a component in a sort of hybrid agent-based model system in order to investigate um, sort of the origin of financial crises and the, the relationship between the real economy and the financial system. So um, I'm 100% with you about that there's a big issue with tooling. And if you want to talk about the tooling around this stuff, um, you know, I'm actively involved in some open source projects that are that are working on that. But I think uh, basically more effort and more, you know, more work is needed to make that about. Thank you. I will now abuse my power, and I will ask a question. Superseding Funky, where uh, I'm giving the word to you in a minute. Um, I, I'm also a law and economics scholar. Uh, but now I want to ask, uh, ask a question much more about kind of legal doctrine. So I, I'm done some research, especially on financial regulation. And there we all know that the law ideally is uh, work counter cyclically. So, and that's something you, uh, you point out in the paper. So which uh, also when you discuss COVID, uh, we should kind of be stricter in periods where everything is better to avoid a uh, pandemic afterwards. We know that. Uh, I'm sure agent-based modeling can give us a kind of better, um, uh, kind of better grasp of what and when, uh, but we know the problem that we have is that, how, how can the law do that? So in a sense, it, it's not that uh, law and economics wants to uh, fit a very simplifying assumption into legal analysis is that the law sometimes is, is dichotomous, is something is allowed or not allowed. Uh, it's very difficult, even from a political economic perspective, changing the law, uh, addressing the, uh, the cycle, the financial cycle, for instance, for 
for financial regulation because that there's some window of opportunity to change a law and is usually after crashes. Uh, so there's a window of opportunity now for COVID and so on and so forth. So what I'm kind of, if I have to generalize my question is I, I see a lot of applications uh, of agent-based modeling from a positive uh, perspective. So to understand how system works and now the law impacts uh, the system, I don't see much uh, from a normative perspective uh, because kind of fine tuning uh, and finding tipping points and working with that with the law uh, may be less straightforward than, uh, uh, than one may think because at the end of the day, the law is about individual adjudication, especially private law. Uh, of uh, of disputes between parties, so of course it can give incentives, but then working counter cyclically can be extremely difficult with the law and with the legislative process in uh, in democracies. So that that's more a uh, methodological question. I think we can couple this with uh, Funky Zeng. One uh, welcome. Thank you. Hi, Sebastian, I really enjoy your talk. So I'm a PhD candidate at the, at the University of Bristol, UK. My PhD is actually on agent-based modeling. So yeah, I just have a quick, 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 quick question that, so how, how, how do you verify your APMs? I mean, how, how do you test your APMs with the real situation in the like uh, economics or norms, because we know that people can always build a lot of different uh, APMs by just uh, changing the rules, the interaction rules of the agents. So, but the uh, real situation is really complicated. So how can you quantify the, uh, validate your APMs? Um, two great points, I guess, uh, uh, to, to Eduardo, um, uh, I, I think that the, the argument that we're making is, is um, talking about um, an intervention in scholarship uh, while being uh, humble and realistic about the actual political impact of, of scholarship. Uh, I think, but, and so I, I think that, um, you know, it's about laying a foundation for policy uh, and then, you know, the political winds may eventually blow in the, in the, in the right way. I think your point about using the point of legal scholarship being about resolving disputes is very interesting. Like I don't haven't really thought about whether agent-based modeling can resolve disputes. Um, and, and that maybe that really uh, goes to the second question. Um, this, the question of, of verification of the models comes up uh, all the time. And um, I don't think we have the best answers um, so far. I think that, Many of the of my colleagues that work on this are actually um, quite unempirical. Um, they they they're they're very skeptical about uh, claims to empirical validation. I think that they almost would rather the models be, uh, and this is sort of a confession, um, you know, a, a, be a presentation of something more axiomatic. So. Um, you know, I work with Joshua Epstein. Um, he, you know, a lot of his framing is agent-based models uh, actually reveal a mathematical truth. Uh, and so um, the, the, the simpler the model, the more general that mathematical truth can be. And so, you, so if, the, if the model's results are very brittle uh, with respect to empirical calibration, it's not as interesting a result as something that's sort of counterintuitive that speaks very broadly to a lot of contexts because it, um, say the results are very robust to a range of initial calibrations. So I think what we're, where we're going with this, and this comes up a lot because we're thinking about using agent-based modeling for software testing, that maybe what we should focus on is less the verification of a particular result or a particular model and more the robustness of results across a range of model or a range of model sort of parameter settings. Uh, but it's a great question. And of course, you know, it's the question. So how, how could I possibly answer it fully? Thank you very much. Are there any other questions at this point? Okay, so if there's no uh, final pressing point, let me uh, thank. Uh, Dr. Bental for uh, being with us. It's early in the mo relatively early in the morning in New York, 
Uh, thanks for uh, presenting in Amsterdam. And I think it uh, was a great discussion. Uh, we are discussing a lot about uh, methodology and legal theory also at this university. So I think it was a great addition uh, to our discussion. And we hope to host you in, uh, in person at some point and to use some agent-based modeling in our, in our research and, and cooperating. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, for uh, being here. Thank you so much, everybody. Oh, you're already disconnected.